let's start with with today's topic so i i would like to give sort of a crash introduction to uh, problems of statistical estimation and we will will uh, will use this as uh, our framework for uh, for the for many next steps that we are, we are going to take uh, so i will define one well, maybe for ma many of you it will not be a, a new definition i will define uh, to you what is known as a random signal or a stochastic process a random field depending on uh, which background you are coming from and then we'll see that it will be very useful uh, to think of many image processing uh, tasks as an inverse problem an inverse problem meaning that uh, I need to invert the action of some operator to extract some latent signal on which the forward operator acted. Okay, so basically, when I acquired an image through a lens that introduced a blur, for example, uh, this forward model is a blurring kernel, and the inverse model is a deconvolution operator. Okay, so we'll show you some toy example today, and we'll see less toy examples in the sequel. So I, I will try to convince you today that the framework of statistical estimation, thinking of an image as as a random quantity, will be helpful. I will show you also some uh, almost correct details about how uh, noise is formed in imaging. I mean, almost correct because I'm going to neglect and ignore some 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 phenomena, which of course happen in the real world. Uh, and uh, and then so once we once we get. To, uh, to the details of the statistical estimation framework, we'll, we'll, I will show you uh, the Wiener filter, of course, this is a classical construction. I will try to convince you that in, in this field it is good for nothing, but at least it will be, it will be easy to derive. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll, I will show you maximum likelihood and maximum a posteriori estimators. And in maximum a posteriori estimators, we'll see that we have two terms. One of them will be uh, a data fitting term telling us how well our estimated signal fits the measurements and another term will be a prior it will uh, at least from the probabilistic perspective it will tell us the prior probability of our uh, uh, of our signal and i think without exaggeration we can s we can say that probably close to 80 or 90 percent of uh, of the literature in image processing in the past i don't know 20 or 30 years concentrated on uh, on devising better priors for for natural images so the the more the more we know, the better we can model our signal, the better we can solve these inverse problems. So basically, once we accept this framework, uh, then basically I will show you a sequence of priors that can be uh, plugged into it, and they will produce increasingly better quality in any image processing task. So just replace the forward model, but by by a forward model that. Uh, you care about in your application, be it deconvolution, denoising, or uh, whatever problem you are trying to solve, super resolution. Maybe. Okay, so so uh, if you if you accept this uh, roadmap, so let's start with with the basics. Okay, so basically we will be building some tools, and then from from these tools uh, we are going to jump to, as I said, to uh, different priors on natural images. Okay, so just a brief recap, and I asked you to uh, read the, uh, the few pages uh, an introduction to uh, elementary probability and estimation that that I posted on on, on the website uh, so let, let me just briefly uh, remind you uh, what we are dealing with so uh, first of all the notion of a probability space so probability space is a triple that uh, is usually uh, defined as Omega Sigma and P Omega is called the sample space. Okay, so for any practical purpose, let's assume that the sample space is an interval between zero and one, but it can be anything. Then sigma is, uh, sorry, it's a subset. Apologies, it's a subset of the power set of omega. So it's a subset of sets. Uh, so basically, it's a set of subsets of uh, of omega. Okay, and the power set omega uh, two to the power omega is obviously all the uh, all the subsets of omega. Okay, so this is called the sigma algebra. It it, it needs to uh, satisfy uh, some elementary properties. Again, you can read them in the in the um, in the pages that I, I posted online. Uh, essentially, if we, we deal with a discrete and finite 
sample space, like for example, you are you are tossing a uh, tossing a dice or something like that, then you don't shouldn't be uh, be caring about the sigma algebra too much. Basically, what what happens here, an an, an element in the sigma algebra is just an event. For example, if the, my sample space is the numbers from one to six integer numbers then the sigma algebra will contain all possible events that can happen. For example, the dice can fall on the number 1, 2, and 5. Okay, so I care about the dice falling on these three numbers, and, uh, and this is a possible outcome of an experiment. I, I'm falling on one of these numbers. When we go to, to continuous, to uncountable spaces, uh, it appears that taking the entire power set is too much. So such a sigma algebra is too big. And it will basically prevent us from defining uh, laws of probability properly. Again, this is hand waving. And then I will need to take something smaller than the entire power set. Okay. So uh, again, this is the sigma algebra. And of course, the most important part of the probability space is a map, is a function from the sigma algebra to uh, uh, to the interval zero one. Okay. And this map assigns probabilities to events. This is called the probability measure. Okay, so it's it's it is actually a measure uh, from the perspective of measure theory. We can integrate with respect to it, uh, and uh, this probability measure again it quantifies probabilities of events. Of course, if I plug into it a set that is not in the sigma algebra, it will give me no result because it is not defined on anything but an event. Okay, so this is this is called the probability space. It is very cumbersome and inconvenient to work uh, with these uh, three. Uh, three objects. So what we typically work with is the notion of a random variable. Okay? And the random variable formally is a map from omega to r. Okay? So we have a map from omega to r and we uh, we we can characterize it by for example by by cumulative distribution functions or probability density functions if if they exist and so on. Okay? So basically by taking a map so we 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 would like to take a mathematical object that is called a number a real number in this case and we would like to add to it some element of uh, randomness so the way mathematicians construct randomness is by defining a map from uh, the sample space from the probability space omega to uh, uh, to the space in which our objects reside okay so if for example we would like think of a vector valued dice or a vector valued coin. So if you want to take the mathematical object of a vector and add to it an element of randomness, well, you know the you know the rule, right? So you take a map from omega to R D. So let's say our, we have an R D dimensional vector, and this will introduce an element of randomness. So basically it is X of omega. Once we fix omega to some omega zero, we get a number, right? Or we get a vector. And by basically taking different values of omega, we can realize different realizations of that uh, of that uh, um, of that mathematical object, and we uh, we can use p to uh, to measure the probability of uh, this realization happening. Okay. So again, you are supposed to know this. So what we I would like to do next, I would like to take another object which is called a function. A signal in our in our terminology, and I would like to add to it an element of randomness. Okay. So in this notation, it would be a map. Let's call it F. I will use calligraphic fonts, but differently calligraphic for for uh, from what we use for operators and Fourier transforms uh, to denote random variables, because usually the random variables are, are denoted by capital letters. We have capital letters reserved for Fourier transforms. So mathematicians use a hat for Fourier transforms, but we'll use them for estimators. So I have no choice. I will. I, I have to use a different font. So basically, f will be a map from omega to the space of, let's say, real-valued functions on R D. Okay. So this is the object I would like to construct. Okay. So I have a map from omega to the space of functions. Another way to express this, I can express this as a map on the product of these domains, D is called the domain of the signal. Okay, so in our example it was RD, and omega of course is the sample space, right? The omega gives the gives us randomness. And S is called the 
is called the, uh, the state of the signal. So we will typically distinguish between continuous domain and discrete domain. So let's say continuous domain is RD and discrete domain is ZD. Okay, so basically the same, the same story uh, we had uh, when the signals were deterministic, right? So we, we could have a continuous domain signal or we could sample it and have a discrete domain signal, right? So w I'm I'm going to show you everything today in the continuous domain, but of course the same uh, the same rules apply in the in the discrete domain. We just replace integrals with sums, and the the uh, the range of this map uh, is a space S that is called the state space. Of course, it can be a vector valued, but let's for simplicity assume it to be scalar valued. It can be a continuous state, okay, and it can be a discrete state. For example, an image, typically an ima a digital image that you get from a, from a camera, is, is, uh, is practically a discrete state process because you, you quantize it. Okay? But it, it will be convenient for us to model it as a continuous state process, something that takes, takes continuous values. And we know that this is an approximation. Okay? So let's... let's Let's try to manipulate this function uh, in different ways. So first of all, again, what is written here is a random function. So it's a function of x, right? And it's also a function of alpha. And alpha is alpha from, alpha from omega. Again, we have omega lowercase reserved for discrete frequencies, right? So uh, the, event, the, the, the sample alpha gives us, uh, gives us uh, randomness, right? So if I select alpha to be fixed to some alpha zero, it is not a random object anymore, right? So what I get is called a realization of the random signal or a sample function. So it is still a function of x, right? Because x is still a variable, but I now fixed omega, it is like I drew a, a, a realization of the function from, from, from that randomness, okay? So, so in, case of a, in case of a random variable, I had a scalar value, in, in, in case of a, a random vector, I had a, a tuple, a d-dimensional tuple. And in case of a random signal, I have a random function, which I now fix, and it becomes deterministic. Okay, so I, I draw a function. So imagine a hat of all possible functions with some probabilities assigned to it. I, I, I take one of them, and I, I can plot it uh, on my screen. Okay, so it's a realization of the, of the stochastic process. If instead I, I fix x, the point in the, in the domain, I am not a function of x anymore, but I'm a function of alpha. So this is called a random variable, right? So if I sample my, my random signal at a point, it can assume different values, different scalar values, right? So it becomes a random variable. And of course, if I fix both, I just have a deterministic value, just a scalar, right? This would be a realization of the stochastic process at a point. Okay, makes sense? Again, we would like to describe the probability that governs the, uh, the, this randomness uh, by using different tools than the probability measure itself. And one of, the, one of the standard tools, for example, to characterize a random vector is by using the cumulative distribution function, or the CDF. So the CDF of a vector x, evaluated at point x lowercase, Okay, so x uppercase will be will be the random quantity, and x lowercase will be the the deterministic quantity. It is simply the probability of these events happening simultaneously. So I'm writing this with with uh, with uh, with the commas, but ev ev essentially I mean the intersection of these events. Okay, and actually this event has to be written as x one omega smaller or equal than x1 and it's sorry it is uh, alpha in omega such that x1 alpha smaller or equal than x1 okay and we have an intersection of uh, these things from uh, x1 to xd okay so this would be the full writing because remember p acts on subsets of omega right and this is a subset of omega this is a sub-level set of the function x1, right? Level set at, at, at level x1, x1 lowercase. But I, I don't like 
this writing because it takes a lot of space. So I'm going to use this, uh, this shorthand notation. Just remember what it stands for. So fx tells me, uh, th tells me the probability of uh, this intersection of events. Okay, and actually it fully characterizes the map x1, of course, up to some zero measure set, right? So we cannot distinguish in terms of probability anything that, I that is distinct by something that has probability zero, okay? Now, for random signals, we could do this trick, but then we would need a function of an infinitely dimensional argument, right? So what we do, what we do instead, we define a finite dimensional CDF. And the idea is, is very simple. Let's take a finite sample of points in the domain of the signal. Once we sample our signal on these n points, we have an n-dimensional vector, right? And an n-dimensional vector can be described by, by, uh, by a regular CDF. Okay, so we define uh, this finite dimensional CDF that has the locations of the samples as its parameters, okay? And then it's a regular CDF of the vector f x1 f xn. Okay, so this vector is a random vector that we sampled from our stochastic process and it has a CDF. Make sense? Yeah, so I, I first select a sample of endpoints, then I so think of a comb that I'm I'm putting on, on, on top of my signal, I'm measuring its values at the points of this comb, and then I arrange them into an n-dimensional vector, and this n-dimensional vector can be described by a regular CDF, like the one here. Okay? Okay, so once we have this function, we can define the notion of stationarity. So stationarity, or strict sense stationarity, abbreviated as SSS, uh, simply means that this function is translation invariant. Okay? So it, it remains the same if we translate. And what, what, what is the translatable part in this function? It's, of course, the selection of the points x, 1 to xn, right? So let's uh, let define it uh, properly. For every n, and every, every uh, sample of size n, x1 to xn, and any translation p in our domain. Basically, the translation acting on this finite dimensional CDF, which means simply add p to, ev to every point in the sample, uh, will be equal to the untranslated f. Okay? So basically, it means that, that the law of probability that governs the stochastic process is the same at, at, in every point of the domain, okay? Every place in the domain has the same law of probability. Of course, if we take a realization, if we take a realization, uh, a realization of, of our stochastic process, there is no reason w for it to be translation invariant, of course, right? We have different values in different, different parts of the domain, but the probability laws that generated it are the same everywhere. This is what, what is meant by stationarity. So if we are talking about a time signal, uh, the, the probability distribution of the signal at time zero and the, and the time uh, one million samples is the same, right? And uh, if we measure moments, we are going to measure the same moments. Uh, for example, and uh, the same about an image. So an image in the left corner, uh, uh, in the le uh, upper left corner, has the same probability distribution as the image in the lower right column uh, corner. Of course, in in practice, there are very very few signals that are truly stationary. But we can say that in so on some scale, uh, stationarity may hold approximately. Okay, and this is a useful model, as we will see in the in the sequel. Okay. Any questions? So again, station, stationarity is, is translation invariance of the probability law and not of the signal itself. Yes? It doesn't lead to some uh, kind of uniform signal or something like that? Uniform? Well, the signal itself is not translation invariant, otherwise it would be constant. But if you measure, for example, statistical quantities like, like moments, you will measure the same quantities everywhere. So it is, it is translation invariant in that sense. Okay, so here again, here we are saying that that so CDF describes uh, the probability 
law in its entirety. So basically, if you, if you have the CDF, you have F. Uh, of course, up to up to some measure zero uh, the differences. Uh, but basically, we can describe something less strict than that, as I will show in, in a few minutes. Okay. So let's define the first and the second order moments of a random signal, which would correspond to to uh, mean and variance of a random variable. Okay, so the mean function is simply the expectation of the signal at point x. So, so of course, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, a, mm, it's a function of x. So sometimes it is, uh, it is denoted by mu, sometimes it is denoted by eta. Probably I will be mixing both. Okay, so it, it's just we just think of our signal as a random variable when we sample at point x. We take the mean, and this gives us a map from x to the mean of f at x. Okay, and then we can. So this is the first order moment, and then we can, we can take the second order moment, and we'll call this the autocorrelation function. Now we we'll have two locations, x1 and x2. And we'll take the expectation of the product of f at x1 and f at x2. Okay? So these are two random variables. And we are computing their, their uh, well, there is no name for this. We can call correlation, but correlation is, uh, is a, for random variables, is, is a normalized quantity. And this is a non normalized quantity. For, for a random signal, it's called the autocorrelation function. Okay. We can also define autocovariance, which would be the central moments. So here, this moment is not central. If the mean is not zero, then this is not not, a, not this doesn't measure the variance, it measures the correlation. Okay. So this is the definition of correlation, and we can take two signals f and g and measure their cross correlation. Again, it will be a function of x1 and x2, but we will take f at x1 and g at x2. Okay, and we'll just use these two sub in the, uh, sub subscripts f and g to indicate that this is the cross correlation of these two signals. Okay, so you can think of direct analogies uh, with random vectors and, and random variables. And of course, we can write it as r of g and f and swap x one and x two. Now. It's it is quite actually it, it it is quite remarkable actually that you can use the notion of correlation of this uh, of this second order moment of the expectation of, of x and y. You can think of x and y as some equivalent class of uh, uh, vectors, and think of this as as their as their norm as their inner product. Sorry. So basically, you can think of x and y inner product defined this way. L then, of course, the variance, or the, the, not the variance, the second order moment, the non-central second order moment will define the norm squared. Okay, so this defines the geometry that is isomorphic to the Euclidean geometry, to the L2, uh, uh, to the L2 norm and the regular Euclidean inner product. And then we say in the, Euclid in the, Euclidean, uh, in the Euclidean geometry, we say that uh, two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is zero, right? So the equivalent for uh, for random signals would will say that f and g are orthogonal if their uh, cross correlation is identically zero at every point. Okay. So this is the notion of orthogonality, and of course for random variables, it is just the, the just their correlation that that is zero. Okay, so basically, once we have the first and the second order moments, so the first of the uh, and the second order moments, of course, are very useful quantities. They do not determine my uh, probability laws underlying this the stochastic process entirely, but they determine some of uh, some of its behavior. So I might have an infinite number of probability distributions that generate the same first and second order moments, but maybe may have different higher order moments. 
Uh, what is useful, basically, we'll see that, uh, for example, linear transformations are very easy to, uh, so it's, it will be very easy to write what happens to these quantities under linear and defined transformations. Uh, and therefore, we will define a less strict uh, notion of stationarity. So stationarity, remember, we said that the probability law expressed in the terms of the CDF was uh, invariant to translation. Let's, re let's relax it a little bit. I will define wide st stationarity by saying that, that just the first and the second order moments will be invariant to translation. So this doesn't define the entire uh, probability law, maybe higher order moments, and the CDF itself are not translation invariant, but at least the first, these two quantities are. And this defines what is called the wide sense stationarity, or WSS. So WSS means that these two functions are translation invariant. Okay, so translation invariance for the mean means simply that the mean function is, is a constant. Let's call it mu f. Okay, and translation invariance for uh, for the autocorrelation function, which is uh, a function of two arguments. We we've been to this exercise already, right? When we talked about shift invariance of of uh, linear systems, right? And our conclusion there was that if we want uh, a kernel of two arguments to be uh, shift invariant or translation, equiva uh, translation equivariant, as, as we called uh, the, the action of the system, then uh, the kernel has to be a function of the difference of the two arguments and not actually a function of, uh, of, of two independent arguments. Okay, so uh, with some abuse of notation, I will simply write. I will simply use the same RF, but write it as a function of x mi x1 minus x2. Okay, so this this is what uh, translation invariance means. Okay, so it, again, it, it means that if we are wide sen sen stationary, then the mean function is just constant, and the autocorrelation function is a function of a single argument, which is the difference in the time uh, in the space locations and not their absolute values, because we don't care which part of the domain we are. We just care about the, the, the distance and the direction that relates between x1 and x2. Okay? Quite, quite, quite easy. And then we can define uh, what is called joint the wide sense stationarity. Uh, this, this, this is defined by saying that the two signals f and g are WSS, and in addition, uh, their cross-correlation function is translation invariant. And again, it means that the cross-correlation function can be expressed as a function of the difference of the arguments. Okay? Any questions? So let's, let's do another trick that is very useful, because we eventually would like to see what happens when uh, a stochastic process uh, undergoes a linear transformation, uh, undergoes, for example, a linear uh, translation equivariant system. And we know that these systems are diagonalized by the Fourier transform, right? So it was very convenient to work in, in the diagonal representation of the system because then the action of the system becomes an element-wise product, a point-wise product in the Fourier domain. So I will try to convince you that uh, when we consider wide, uh, wide sense stationarity, then our um, shift invariant uh, uh, autocorrelation functions will also be diagonalized by the Fourier transform. So it will be also convenient to work in the Fourier domain. And this will gi uh, give us the notion of uh, power spectrum density or the spectrum of the signal. So, but I would like to start from a completely different point. Okay, so let's take a deterministic quantity, deterministic signal f, function of x, and let's, let's measure its energy. So its energy will be defined as the as the L2 norm squared of the signal. Okay? So just, just imagine that our signal, let's say, measures voltage. Its square measures power, right? When we integrate it over T, power integrated over time gives us energy, right? Of course, we can write this, uh, this L2 norm explicitly. It will be just the integral of F uh, squared over entire RD. And we'll use Parseval's identity to write this uh, squared norm as the squared norm of the Fourier transform. Okay, so this is the, the energy of the signal. Now, it might happen that 
a signal, for example, a periodic signal that we have seen before, they have infinite energy. So it, a certain period has an energy, and then you have an infinite amount of such periods, you have, you have this integral summing to infinity. So it's not, not a very useful notion in this case. But we can still define, by doing proper normalization, we can still define some useful quantity. So let's define the average power in the following way. I will, I will not integrate over the entire domain. I will integrate in a window of size uh, t in each direction. So it's a d-dimensional window. It's a d-dimensional box function that, uh, that the, um, to, into which I'm going to restrict my, my integral. Of course, this will give me a finite quantity. And then I will normalize by 1 over t to the power d, which, which is the volume of this window. And this will give me the energy in the window. Okay? So the, the average energy in, in, the, in the window, because I'm dividing by the, the volume of the window. And then I will take t in the limit going to infinity. So once I did this normalization, of course, I will get a, a finite quantity. Okay, so let's call this w. And I can write this as the limb of 1 over uh, t to the power d, uh, d half times rect t, or we call this box t sometimes, uh, product with f, pointwise product with f. And of course, this rect t is just a tensor product of one dimensional rectangle scaled by t. Okay? Make sense? Now, let's examine this quantity inside the limit. And I will allow myself to, uh, to move the limit around at my pleasure, replace it with, with, with sums. Of course, there, are, there is some mathematical rigor that is required to do this, but it is doable. Okay, so I will just, I would like to translate this to the Fourier domain. So I will define what is called a windowed Fourier transform, with, which is the Fourier transform of the signal uh, windowed by, by this uh, box function, and also normalized by this factor. So this is the square root of t to the power d because when I put it, I put it inside the norm squared, it goes outside the norm without the square root. Okay? So the, the, to get the, the constant here. And uh, with, with, this, with this notation, I can simply write this using, again, Parseval's identity. I replace the norm in the space domain with the norm in the Fourier domain. So this will be the limit t going to infinity of the windowed Fourier transform L2 norm squared. Okay? And I, of course I can write the norm on the entire space because of the window. Okay, so this defines me the average power of the of the of the signal. And let's just write it explicitly. It's the, the limit t going to infinity, the integral of the absolute value of the Fourier transform squared. Uh, integrated over all, all frequencies. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, here maybe I don't care about the absolute value because I usually assume that f is a real valued signal, but for the Fourier transform I must write the absolute value because it's a complex valued signal. Now let's interpret, I'm, I'm again, I'm allowing myself to move the limit inside the integral. Okay? And it works when it works. And here it does. Uh, so I would like to interpret this quantity. So this quantity tells me the amount of power in the signal per unit of frequency. So when we have something per unit of something, we call it density, right? So it's the density of the power of the signal per unit of frequency. Okay? So for example, if we have a one-dimensional time signal, it will, be, it will be watt per hertz. Okay? It will, be, it will have these units, power per, power per, uh, per frequency. And we call it the power spectrum density. Again, it's the, uh, the amount of power the signal has per unit of frequency. At different frequencies, it might have different power, different amount of contribution to the entire power of the signal. Okay? So it's the Fourier representation of the, of the power contained in the signal. Okay? So this was for the deterministic quantity f. Let's now define exactly the same thing for a stochastic signal. So we have, I will assume that it is WSS, while it's stationary. Now, 
I will define again a windowed Fourier transform of my stochastic quantity. You see now, you have, instead of a deterministic signal, you have a stochastic signal here. Now, what is this mathematical object? It's not a number anymore. Previously, it was a number. Now, it's not a number because different realizations of f will give me different values. So it's a, it's a random variable. It is a random quantity. And of course, I don't want to remain with a random quantity. I would like to, to, to get something deterministic. So I will take the expectation of this quantity. Okay? And I will define this as the power spectrum density. So the same quantity we had before for a, a deterministic quantity it remains the same for a stochastic quantity except this expectation operator, which I'm pushing into the limit. Again, I'm exchanging the order of integration and, and limit. And we have tools like dominated convergence uh, uh, lemma, for example, to, to do this, uh, this exchange. So th th this, is, this is my definition of the power, uh, power spectrum density. Let's, let's play a little bit with this expression. So first of all, the, uh, what, what goes under the expectation is the absolute value squared of the windowed Fourier transform. Let's write it explicitly. It is the windowed Fourier transform complex conjugate times the windowed Fourier transform. Let's write it explicitly as the two integrals. So I will write it as one integral will be integrated with respect to dx, another one with respect to dx prime, because I want to write it as a single integral. I, I just arbitrarily chose two different integration variables. One will have a plus here in the exponent, another one will have a minus. And I'm not putting conjugate on f itself, because I'm assuming it is a real valued signal. Otherwise, I would have to put a conjugate. Okay, so this, uh, this is a product of two integrals. I can combine their integrands, uh, which is basically take a product of their integrands and integrate over this domain, domain square, right? And I can also push the expectation inside. So I did all these steps together. I'm now integrating, pay attention, on the window cross the window, so basically the, the, the cross of these, the, the Cartesian product of these two windows. The integrand is this quantity, which is basically what is written here is the only stochastic part that, that appears under the integral. And then the product of the exponents, I can write this as a single exponent, okay? And the integration is dx, dx prime. Now, what is this? What is, th what is this quantity? How did we call it? This is the autocorrelation of, of, the, of the signal, right? So, and we know that it is WSS. This is why I assumed it is WSS. If it is WSS, it is a function of the difference of x and x prime. Okay? So you see, you have the difference of x and x prime here, and you have the difference of x and x prime here. And you're integrating over two independent variables, but the integrand only depends on, on their difference. So I, I will not bother you with these details, but you can do a change of the, of the integration variables. There will be some Jacobian that will pop up, but it, it will be simple. And what you get as the result is that this, uh, this definition of the power spectrum density is actually the Fourier transform of the of the uh, autocorrelation function. Okay, so basically, after this change of integration variables, what you have is the Fourier transform of the of the uh, autocorrelation function. Okay, so basically, you write here y and y, and you can recognize the Fourier transform, right? So it is quite it is quite quite I I I don't know if uh, if you follow it entirely, but it's it is quite a remarkable result. We started with with a very very uh, practical and very very straightforward definition of the uh, spectrum density of uh, of a stochastic quantity the same way we did for a deterministic quantity right so we wanted to measure how much power is contained per unit of frequency and we ended up with the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function okay and this result is called the the Wiener or the Wiener Kinchin theorem usually named or named things in named results in mathematics are important. Yes. Is this minus two pi i or plus? Because if it's the Fourier, it's, the, it's also minus two pi i. Right? 
Yeah, but the, the autocorrelation function is, is symmetric. It is even. It, with the function at x minus x prime and the function at x prime minus x is exactly the same. So here it doesn't matter, but you're right. Okay, so th this is called the wiener kinchin theorem, and it relates the Fourier transform of the uh, of the autocorrelation function with the definition of the power spectrum density. Okay, and we can do the same for a pair of signals. We can define what can be called a cross spectrum density, which will be exactly the same the same definition, but now instead of the absolute value squared under the expectation, we have the product of the windowed Fourier transform of f a joint, or uh, con complex conjugate, times the window for the form of the another signal, G, without the complex conjugate. And when we do the math, again, we have the wiener keynesian theorem that tells us that this will be the free form of the cross correlation of F and G. Okay, and you can just follow the same derivation here. Actually, this is a more general result, right? Because if I substitute G equals F, I get the previous result. So this is this is quite uh, quite convenient. Let's see what happens now when a wide sense stationary signal goes through a linear system, linear uh, translation equivariant system or an LSI system. Before that, let me show you the same story for random vectors, and you will see that we are going to get exactly the same the same result. Okay. So let's suppose we have a random vector x let's say in R n, and we define a new vector which is linearly transformed by a deterministic matrix. And let's say A is in R m by n. So Y is an m-dimensional vector. Okay. And I would like to I would like to measure first of all first of all the mean of y, and I would like to measure the, instead of uh, an autocorrelation function, we have a correlation matrix, a correlation matrix of y, which is the expectation of, of y, y transpose, okay, it's an m by m matrix, and I might be also interested in the correlation matrix x, cross correlation matrix x, y, which is the expectation of x, Y transpose, and this is an n by m dimensional matrix. Okay, so let's just use the linearity of expectation. So mu y is obviously the expectation of y, which is the expectation of a x, which is a times the expectation of x, and the expectation of x I can call it mu x. Okay, so the 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 mean is simply transformed by the same a okay now what happens here what happens here is that this becomes an expectation of a x x transpose a i can take a and a transpose outside the expectation and what we have here is the expectation of x x transpose and we can call it a r x a transpose okay now, for the for the cross correlation matrix, I will just need to substitute y once. It will be x x transpose a transpose, which amounts to r x a transpose. Okay. So again, the mean is transformed by a. The the uh, correlation of the output. The correlation matrix of the output is transformed by A on one side and A transpose on the other side. So it is transformed by A, a squared, essentially. And the, the cross-correlation of the input and the output is transformed by A transpose on the right side. Okay? Let's, let's see how we have exactly the same rules for uh, stochastic signals. And I will uh, assume that I have some some convolution kernel H acting on my stochastic signal F and the result is called G. Okay, so I'm just using different letters. What will be the, what will be mu G, the expectation of, uh, the expectation function of G? Well, it will be just the expectation of GX. Let's plug it, uh, plug into GX 
the convolution integral that we have here, right? It's the convolution of f with h. The integration variables is, is x prime. And I'm moving the expectation inside. Again, uh, basically expectation is just an integral, so I can swap the order of different integrations. And uh, the expectation of this only stochastic quantity here is the is the uh, is the expectation function mu of uh, of the original signal f, okay? And uh, we know that for a wide uh, uh, sense stationary signal, this function is constant, and I will call this constant mu f, okay? What remains inside the integral is just the sum of uh, of all the values of the, the convolution of the kernel of the impulse response of the of the system H, and we can write it in the Fourier domain by saying that this is the DC response. It is the Fourier domain at zero frequency of H. Okay, and so so basically this is how this is how the uh, how the mean is transformed. Okay. Let's see what happens to the to the co to the autocorrelation function. So uh, the autocorrelation function, of course, I, I cannot assume that the out that the outcome will be um, that the outcome will be uh, WSS. I need to prove this, right? So here we see that the WSS conditions here are satisfied, at least for the first order mo uh, moment, because it has to be constant. I, uh, if if I if I want G to be WSS. Its first order moment has to be constant, and it is indeed constant, right? I just need to show that the second order moment will also be constant. So I, I write the autocorrelation already in this form to uh, to be basically to to toss off x conveniently and write it just as a function of y. I uh, I cannot toss off x before I show that it doesn't depend on x, right? So uh, currently, my, I'm writing the general definition of the of the autocorrelation function. It is the expectation of g at point x and g at point x plus y, right? This is how it is defined. It's it is. Uh, I'm substituting the, the this definition of g in in the form of these two convolution integrals inside the expectation. Let's rearrange the expression. I will uh, integrate over dx prime inside and dx prime outside, and I will take hx prime prime outside from here. Okay. Now, what is written? And of course, I'm moving the expectation inside. So, what is written here looks like the autocorrelation function of f, right? Evaluated at which point? Evaluated at the point y plus x prime prime minus x, okay, and what is written here is convolution. So it's the convolution of H with this function evaluated at this point, right? So let's write it explicitly. So we we keep the outer integral over dx prime prime, uh, and what is written here, what is written here, basically all these parentheses is just the convolution of H with the autocorrelation of F evaluated at point Y plus X prime prime. Now, this also looks like convolution, but almost convolution. Why almost? It's almost because of the plus here, right? It has to be minus in the convolution. So let's just define a new variable. I will define H bar of X as H minus X. We did it already several times. When we did some some derivations, uh, so I can define a new variable. Let's call it y prime. Y prime is minus x prime prime, and now with respect to this variable, I have convolution, but not with h, but with the mirrored version of h. Okay. So it's a convolution of R f with h with h mirrored evaluated at point y. Now if I if I if I would write this as an operator, it would be H acting on RF 
and then H, a joint acting on RF, right? The joint operator of convolution is convolution with a mirrored uh, impulse response, right? We did it when we when we calculated the joint operators. H, I'm assuming H is a is a real valued impulse response, and this is exactly what we had for the matrices, right? We had R X multiplied by A from the left by A transpose from the right. Okay, so basically a transpose of a toplex operator is a, is again a toplex operator convolution with a mirrored impulse response. Okay, makes sense. Okay, let's continue. So this was this was the uh, this was the autocorrelation function of the output G and pay attention not only does it resemble uh, almost verbatim the the matrix case the the, the vector uh, vector case pay attention that here also we have no dependence of the result on x it means that uh, g is wss right so it, it had it had the mean independent of of x and now it has the the autocorrelation uh, independent of x so g is wss Let's now evaluate the um, cross correlation of the input and the output. Again, it will be exactly the same exercise, but now we'll have just one convolution because we we have the expectation of f at x and g at x plus y, plus y. So I'm plugging in g here. This is the convolution integral that I wrote here. And again, we have uh, I'm moving the expectation inside I'm rearranging the order of the of the of the integrands so what we have here is the it should be f of course I apologize it should be f this is f let's fix it it's obviously f uh, so I have the it's f okay bug so it is the convolution of of, the, of rf at point y plus x with respect to, uh, uh, to the integration variable d, dx prime so it looks almost like convolution except that I, uh, convolution had it has minus instead of plus so i'm going to rearrange uh, my integration variable again let's call minus x prime Let's call it y prime. I'm going to integrate with respect to y prime. H will become h bar, and this is the result I have here. Not on y. I'm writing this f, f g. So it is the uh, autocorrelation of f convolved with h bar, and I can write this as the autocorrelation of f with the system with a joint system h star acting on it, right? And this. Remember this corresponding perfectly to the result we had in the matrix in the matrix uh, and vector case, right? So it's exactly the same the same story here. And of course, because the result doesn't depend on x, we can say that f and g are jointly WSS. So not only is the output uh, WSS, the uh, input and the output are jointly WSS. It is not, not, not very surprising, right? So we have a system whose action is translation invariant, and we have a signal whose probability uh, law is translation invariant. So as a result, the probability law of the outcome will also be translation, translation invariant. Okay, so let's let's summarize these these property. Uh, I would like to state them both in the in the uh, in the space domain in terms of the correlation functions and in the Fourier domain in terms of the of the power spectrum density. So basically, we had this property that if we have H convolved with F, the 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 autocorrelation of this signal will be H uh, convolution with H bar convolution with R F. And in the spectrum, of course, the action of H is simply H. The action of H bar translates to H star, to H conjugate, right? Because we are, we are inverting the sign of X. It is like 
putting a minus in the exponential of, of the Fourier transform, and this is like inverting the phase. It is taking the complex, uh, the, the, uh, the complex conjugate. And what is h times h star? Is the absolute value of h squared, right? So I can write it like this. And this is called, if h is called the, the frequency response of, of a system, h uh, absolute value squared is called the power response of the system, because it, it tells us how, how the power, the spectrum density, is attenuated or amplified at different frequencies. Okay, so this is the power, the, the power response of, uh, of the system. We had the we had the cross correlation of the input with the output, and we saw that it was given by the convolution of the of the input autocorrelation with h bar. In the spectrum, it will be the cross spectrum of f input and h convolution f the output. It will become the the this cross spectrum is the spectrum of f uh, product with h uh, conjugate, and of course we can just Sorry, we can of course we can uh, say the same uh, for about the reversed order, uh, but let's let's let me show you first a few more basic properties of of correlations and uh, the corresponding spectra. So first of all, uh, the autocorrelation of uh, a signal is an even function if the signal is real valued. Uh, it is an even function because if we evaluate the expectation of f at 0 and f at x, it is the same as evaluating the expectation of uh, f at x times f at 0, which is the uh, which is the autocorrelation at minus x, right? So uh, the correlation at uh, x is equal to the autocorrelation at minus x. And for an even function, the spectrum is real. So the Fourier transform of this symmetric function, mirror symmetric function, is, is a real function. Okay? Do I need to prove this, or is it obvious? It, it's, it's quite straightforward, right? It's a very simple property of the Fourier transform. Now, what is another interesting fact is that this function, the, the autocorrelation function, is positive semi-definite. Semi -definite. And we know, of course, what a positive semi-definite matrix is. And the positive semi-definite function is such a function that every and dimensional sample from it will form a, a, a positive semi-definite matrix. So if we sample, let's say, locations x1 to xn, and we evaluate the, um, the, 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 the autocorrelation function on, uh, on, the, on the differences between all these pairs of locations, we'll get a matrix, which would be the correlation matrix of uh, the random vector f x1 to f at xn. Uh, and this matrix will be positive semi-definite, and this stems from uh, uh, this stems from the properties of uh, of covariance and uh, invariance, which is the property of the of those norms and inner products that uh, I said are equivalent to to, this, uh, to the second order moments, and this property is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay, so it's exactly it's exactly the same property. And positive semi-definiteness in the spectrum means that the spectrum is non-negative. Okay, because remember, the spectrum is the diagonalized form of this uh, of this function. So if the function is positive semi-definite, it means that in its diagonal representation, which contains the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are going to be non-negative. Of course, there are different ways to prove this fact. I'm not going to prove it. Now, the... Uh, the cross-correlation function is not even, but I can say that if I want to swap the subscripts f and g, it is like mirroring the argument. Okay, so I will write this as r bar. It means that the, the cross-spectrum of fg is the complex conjugate of the, of the cross-spectrum of g with f. And I can use this, this result to write another version of, of, this, uh, of this identity. I can write uh, the, the autocorrelation of h convolved with f, uh, autocorrelation with f, as h and not h bar convolution with rf. And in the spectrum, the cross spectrum of h convolved with f. And f is the, cross, is the spectrum of f times h and not h conjugate. 
Okay, so sometimes uh, the first identity is useful, sometimes the, the other identity is useful. But they are completely equivalent. Okay, any questions? So once, so remember, uh, remember that we we can use uh, uh, we can use linear systems to uh, to uh, modify the shape of uh, of the power spectrum density of a signal. So let's take a signal. I will call it N, whose spectrum is just a constant. Let's call this constant sigma squared of N. It's just flat for every frequency. It's the same amount of power. And if we take the inverse Fourier transform, what is the inverse Fourier transform of the constant? It's, it's a delta, right? So if, if I have something flat, basically flat equal power at every frequency, it means that it, is, it will be super localized in the, in, the, in the dual domain, in the space domain in this case. So the autocorrelation function will be a delta times the sigma square, okay? So it, basically it means that there is no correlation between with the sample I'm sending it, uh, it and uh, any adjacent sample. Okay, this uh, this is what it means uh, uh, that my uh, power spectrum density is is flat, and and such signals are called white noise. Okay, so white noise means delta as the as the uh, autocorrelation and flat spectrum, and it's called white because uh, because. Uh, white light that comes from sun has approximately flat electromagnetic spectrum as a function of the wavelength, which is not true. And not any, any white light uh, that we perceive as white has a flat spectrum. But anyway, this is a useful analogy. And uh, what happens if we take this white noise and we pass it through a linear system? every frequency will be multiplied by this power response of the system. So if, for example, the system is a low pass, Let's, let's, uh, let's take the white noise and we integrate it. Integrator is a low-pass filter. It has a, it has a decaying uh, frequency response as the frequency grows. Uh, so in this case, we are going to have what is called the red noise. So it has more density, more power for low frequencies and lower power for high frequencies. So if we think of, for example, of the white noise, as some random displacements of a particle, let's say a one-dimensional particle, so it can go either one step forward or one step uh, backward, or some, think of it continuous, some continuous uh, values of, of, of this step. So the white noise will be the increments that the particle is taking, and the location of the particle will be the integral. So it will be the red noise. And the, uh, the another name for red noise is Brownian noise, because what this, Location of the particle describes a physical phenomenon that is called uh, Brownian motion. It's the thermal motion of particles. Uh, and sometimes it is called brown noise, not because of any resemblance uh, of the color to brown, it's just an incorrect, an incorrect term. So red, of course, resembles the, uh, the spectrum of red light that has more power in lower frequencies in higher wavelengths and less power in, in, in higher frequencies. If we, instead of integration, we do differentiation of the white noise, we'll, we'll have something like, uh, uh, basically, we have at, we'll attenuate low frequencies and, and amplify high frequencies, and the resulting colored noise is called blue noise. Okay, and, and a physical example of blue noise is, is sharing of radiation. It's the equivalent uh, of a sonic boom for, uh, for electromagnetic waves. So if a, a, a particle enters a medium uh, with so speed of light in medium is lower than the universal constant. If, the, if a, a very fast particle enters a medium with lower speed of light, it will be super luminous. It will be, it will be moving faster than, the, faster than the phase velocity of light in that medium. And it will create a phenomenon that uh, is equivalent to sonic boom. And it will be visible as blue light emitted from, uh, from that particle. And for example, all the, those... Uh, the typical depiction of all the nuclear stuff is something that glows blue. This is exactly Cherenkov's uh, radiation. And this is a physical embodiment of blue noise. Okay, and uh, of course, just to, just to uh, complete the picture, the autocorrelation of colored noise, basically white noise colored by the action of the system H, 
will be simply given by this convolution of the impulse response H with its mirrored version. And it is a deterministic quantity. You see, this is, this is a function. It is a deter deterministic quantity. And sometimes this quantity is called the autocorrelation of H. So we define autocorrelation as the, uh, as the expectation of the product of, of two uh, stochastic quantities. But basically, you see, it is also quite natural, convenient to call this convolution of H with H, mir H mirrored or the inner product of H and H shifted, we uh, basically call it autocorrelation, okay? When you compute autocorrelation in MATLAB, this is what you compute. So let's, let's say, if we are talking about noise already, let's, uh, uh, let's say a few words about noise in imaging. So let's take, let's zoom in into, uh, into this device. Let's zoom, uh, let's go pa past the lens, all, all the stuff that is, uh, glued to the wafer, let's go to the single pixel in this, in this device and see what happens uh, inside the pixel. So the pixel receives a wavefront of electromagnetic radiation that carries energy, right? So let's start with this. So some light comes in, right? And we can, of course, take uh, what is physicists call the pointing vector of, of, this, of this electromagnetic wave and translate it into the amount of uh, energy that is uh, the amount of power that is the, the amount of energy that is deposited per unit of area per unit of time, which will be uh, what is called in radiometry irradiance. Irradiance is the amount of power per unit of area. Okay, so if we have a very bright picture, that those bright parts will receive more power per unit of uh, area, which is our uh, unit of area is our pixel. Okay, so. In the optic part, what will, ha what will happen? We'll have, some, we'll have some gain, some factor that I'm writing here as this triangle. There will be some multiplicative factor that will translate this power per unit of, of area to the, number, to the mean number of photons that the pixel is receiving. But I cannot receive a, a, a 10, a 10, a 10 photons and half. Right, this is photons is a, is a discrete quantity. So, actually, there will be a random process, a Poisson random process. Basically, imagine that that there is somebody tossing coins, and every time a, a, the coin falls on 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 its head, a photon is emitted. So, it, it is a random process, and basically, all these independent, basically, the sum of independent uh, uh, tosses of a coin has Poisson statistics. So it, there will be a Poisson statistic that I will show you in, in the sequel how we can approximately model this as additive noise. But this is not additive noise, at least not, not simple, simple additive noise. So we'll have the, um, the number of photons uh, uh, obeying Poisson statistics. Then uh, this photon will hit a light-sensitive part of the pixel and it will deposit uh, its energy in the form of electric charge. Basically, this will, call, this will be called photoelectrons that are generated inside the pixel. So there is some conversion ratio. For every photon, uh, the pixel receives a certain amount of photoelectrons. This conversion ratio is called the quantum efficiency of the pixel. This, this is typically the function. Uh, it's, it's a function of everything you can imagine, but it is most importantly a function of the wavelength, also temperature, and many, many other, other parameters. Then you, you think that this deposited charge is the only thing you are going to get in a pixel. It's wrong. You also have some un, undesired uh, uh, phenomena happening. Like for example, there is some amount of current that that deposits charge in the pixels, even if the pixels are completely dark, and it is called the dark noise. And you also then when you uh, when you take the charge from the pixel and you want to uh, to measure it, you go through an amplifier, to, through an analog system that also has some noise, which is called the readout noise. It's the thermal noise of, of, of electronics. And then you pass it through an, uh, through an A to D, through an analog to digital. Uh, yes, there is. Oh, 
okay, okay. So um, I will, I will, I will specify this, this, uh, this exactly. So basically, so the dark current is just a bias to. Well, you will see it in in the, in the equations. So the dark current is just just a bias that uh, that deposits current to the to the pixels, but it has a bias and a variance, and that variance also has having Poisson statistics. Is uh, is called the dark uh, the dark noise, and that is the disturbing part in uh, in in uh, in the pixel. Then, when you go to the A to D to the analog to digital uh, uh, conversion unit, it takes the it takes the output of this of this amplifier here, and it converts it to some what is called DN or ADUs, uh, analog to digital, digital units or digital uh, number, digital levels. This is actually the value of the image that you are going to see eventually. And uh, the A to D does this conversion. This conversion is called the, the gain of the sensor. It, it is the ISO setting on your digital camera that you are, that you are setting. This is exactly the gain. Uh, a baseline is added to avoid negative values. And then the result is quantized. And this quantization, I will show you, can be modeled as injection of uniformly distributed noise, at least if the quantization is fine enough. So basically, uh, this is more or less what happens inside, inside the sensor. Uh, there are some parts relating to, to the optics, some parts relating to the electronics of the sensor, and some parts related to the analog to digital conversion. So let's see, let's see it in, in, uh, uh, now with some math, OK? And then will make a few conclusions about, uh, basically, for example, if you want to do denoising, you often encounter in, in many, many papers. Uh, let's assume that the image is contaminated by additive IID noise. Is this a correct model? Let, let's, let's, see, uh, let's see. If it is not correct, we'll try to, to, f to fix something to make it correct. So we are starting with irradiance. Irradiance measured in, in the units of watts per meter squared. It's the power of light, uh, power carried by, by the wavefront coming to the pixel per unit of area. Let's multiply it by the pixel area, actually the effective pixel area, because the pixel has some micro lens that amplifies its area significantly. And let's multiply this by exposure time. So. Uh, what is joule per uh, joule, time, uh, joule per second, right? And uh, so it's energy per second over meter squared times meter squared times second. So we have energy. So the the product is in the units of energy. We have the energy coming uh, coming to the pixel within the exposure time to, uh, uh, in which we are integrating these photons. Let's divide this by. Uh, by this quantity, which is the energy of a single photon. So I'm assuming that I'm illuminating the sensor with monochromatic light that has wavelength lambda. And every time you see the Planck's constant and the speed of light popping up, it means that there is some quantum phenomenon uh, happening. So basically, this hc over lambda is the, exactly the energy of a single photon uh, with wavelength lambda. So let's, let's it, it, of course, it is measured in, in the units of of energy joules, so let's let's divide the first quantity by the second quantity, and we'll have unitless quantity that is the mean number of photons. Okay, so the mean number of photons it's the energy that the pixel received in in uh, uh, in terms of number of photons. Of course, if you have a pixel sensitive to wide, uh, uh, basically wide spectrum of wavelengths, and your incoming light has some spectral distribution. Instead of writing E, we'll write DE. And instead of lambda, we'll write D lambda, and we'll, we're going to integrate everything. Okay. So this is the mean number of photons. The actual number of photons is a Poisson variable with this mean. Okay. As I said, it's a counting process. Counting processes have Poisson statistics. Yes. The mean number of photons is, is, uh, is a deterministic quantity. It's the uh, it's the rate of arrival of uh, of this energy in terms of photon. The actual measurement. It's not the actual. The actual measurement is the re re realization of this Poisson variable. So so the number of photons is distributed with Poisson statistics, and what I'm measuring is the realization of this variable. Okay, so that's why images have noise. Right, 
this is one this is the, one of the one of the dominant components of noise this is the mean so it's expectation see it's it's eta uh, eta gamma so I, I said I will be using eta and mu uh, uh, both to indicate expectations so here I'm using eta as, as the expectation okay so let's now take this gamma multiplied by the quantum efficiency so quantum efficiency is a is a unitless uh, uh, coefficient, but we can attribute it the units of electrons per photon. Okay, so it's in units of electrons per photon. And the resulting quantity, so Q is called the quantum efficiency, the resulting quantity is the number of photoelectrons deposited in the in the pixel. Okay. But this uh, this is not the only source of photoelectrons. We would like the only source of photoelectrons to be coming from from light. But actually, there are other electrons that are deposited in the in the pixel due to other sources. One of them is the dark, the dark current, which is also a Poisson variable. So it will add some bias to this to this quantity, but it will add variance, and that is that that variance is called the dark noise. Okay. And Poisson Poisson distributed noise is typically called shot noise. So basically, we have shot noise because of the light that we are shining on our pixel, and we have Poisson noise because of the dark current that, the dark current uh, is measured in amperes per meter squared, but basically we can measure it in terms of electrons, uh, I mean, electrons per second per meter squared, or electrons per second per pixel, because basically it has, electron has the unit of charge, electron per second has a unit of current, of ampere. And, and, and w when we measure it per unit of uh, area, we can measure it per pixel. Pixel has a, a unit of area. And then we have the readout noise, which is the, uh, just the thermal noise of our electronics. And we can model it as, uh, just as a, as, a, as a normally distributed noise. Okay. Next, we are going to take this these photoelectrons, multiply them by the conversion gain of the of the sensor at the baseline, the, the a, a to the offset. And this is going to be our image that we are actually producing, right? Almost correct. The DNs are are, are the are those unitless uh, unitless uh, quantities of light that well, so let's say we have brightness level one and brightness level two in the image the difference between one and two eventually translates to the amount of energy that the pixel the pixel saw. But this is not the, not the end of the game because this is a continuous quantity, but actually we can we have to discretize it, we have to quantize it. So this is the rounding operation that the quantizer does. And instead of this rounding, I can model it as the injection of quantization noise, which is uniformly distributed between zero to two to the uh, to the power of minus the number of bits minus one, so it's, this is the rounding error that the quantizer introduces, and it's much nicer to uh, model quantizers as injection of noise rather than working with discrete quantities. Okay, so summarizing all this, we have this mass. This is the image we are going to measure. Okay. Call it D. So it has a lot of contributions. So basically, what we really care about is this. This is the amount of light, or maybe A times the exposure time, right? Uh, this is what we care about. All the rest is just noise. Okay? So let's, let's assume that we have short exposure time, so enough amount of light, short exposure time, and high effective number of bits. So it means that we can neglect the quantization noise, uh, and these contributions will be negligible compared to the shot noise of the light itself, comp compared to this variance of the Poisson variable. Okay, so then I'm just throwing all the rest and I, I stay with this. Because you see the dark noise, so the dark noise, the noise that comes from the dark current, it is... Uh, sure, sure, sure. But So the dark current usually has... Uh, has uh, contributes a few electrons per second, right? So when I am exposing for a few milliseconds and and I have a usable image, it means that that this quantity is big. 
Okay, so even multiplied by a short exposure, it is big. So wh this means that that the shot noise of the light itself dominates uh, dominates this quantity. And then I can, pardon? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm, I'm again. I'm assuming that uh, my readout noise is uh, negligible compared to uh, uh, compared to uh, to this quantity. If I'm not ignoring the readout noise, I will have a sum of Poisson and Gaussian variable. And we, we, this is this is the standard uh, model that is assumed in in imaging typically. But I would like to ignore the readout noise. Okay. So let me also assume that I have enough amount of light. And for enough amount of light, so remember, Poisson, Poisson uh, variables are discrete. They have discrete values. But for, let's say, for mean more or less equal to, to 100 photons and more, uh, I can approximate the Poisson variable by a, by a normal variable with, uh, with the mean equals, equal to the variance. Okay, so this is, this is a, a hallmark of the, of the Poisson statistics that the mean is, is equal to the variance. And uh, the normal approximation is not bad. If I have a, uh, if I have a low light scenario, then I need to introduce corrections for uh, for the discrete nature of the Poisson uh, of the Poisson variable. I can cannot neglect all the other sources of noise, of course, in that case. But I would like to keep it simple because I'm I'm, I'm going to show you some something that uh, basically that we need to do to our image before we can assume additive noise models. Uh, so basically, I will assume this. Uh, normal model for um, for my shot noise, okay, and I can take the I can take this mean and write it here. So it will be basically some deterministic quantity, which is the mean plus the baseline and plus zero mean normal noise, okay. So it is. It is a statistically uh, independent additive noise. It, by the way, this is not exactly true. So it, it is white in the sense that it is, uh, it is a different and independent noise at every pixel. This is not exactly true because of a crosstalk phenomenon that happens in real pixels. When light uh, hits the shot noise, uh, basically goes to adjacent pixels as well. Uh, so there is some statistical dependence. There is some coloring of this noise in, in the space domain. But let's ignore it. Uh, uh, again, th these phenomena can become very strong, very important, but usually they are, they are, they are like second-order corrections. Well, the main phenomenon that I'm interested in is the shot noise. So it is independent, it is additive, I wrote it as an additive noise, right? But it is not identically distributed. You see why? Because the variance here depends on the signal. So let me write it in a different way. I will call all this mess alpha, that multiplies E, and they have a different mass here that I will call it beta, that multiplies E in the variance. So my signal is this alpha E plus B. I, of course, I care about E. This is my, uh, my light, uh, basically my irradiance that I wanted to measure with this camera. And uh, I have E appearing in the variance as well. So if I have a different irradiance at a different pixel, the variance there will be different. The signal to noise ratio will be different. Okay? The signal to noise ratio here is as you can see it's uh, it's uh, alpha e over the square root of beta beta e. Okay? And it is very it, it is very ugly to work with noise noises that are not identically distributed because many, basically uh, most of the models you will find in the literature assume uh, white uh, additive zero mean IAD noise, uh, but this is not IAD. Okay, so let's let's do a manipulation to the to the image to this random quantity to make basically the noise IAD. Okay, so again, this is the signal, and this is the noise. Additive, but not uh, not IAD. I, will, I would like to do a nonlinear transformation, I will call it h, to this variable, such that the, the, uh, uh, the variance of the resulting of the transformed random quantity will be, will be constant. And let's make it 1 for convenience. This is called the variance stabilizing transfor transformation. 
So I don't want to work with D directly. I would like to work. I would like to first make an affine transformation of this uh, of this variable. So the affine transformation I'm going to do, I will subtract B and then scale by alpha over over beta. So when I do this, uh, as you can see, this quantity has mean alpha squared over beta e, and it has variance alpha squared over beta e. Okay, so it is normal with mean and variance equal. And it's, it's my model for Poisson distribution. Okay, so by doing this simple affine transformation, I'm back to something that behaves like Poisson statistics. Okay, and now I will be transforming this variable x. Okay, and I will call this alpha squared, beta I will call it gamma, just to reduce the amount of Greek letters I'm writing in the same, in the same line. And I would like to find such h that makes the variance unit. Okay. So let's do this. I I, I will demand sigma y squared to be one. Okay. And let's approximate y. So why 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 is some messy nonlinear transformation? It's very difficult to to compute its variance unless I know exactly the function, but I want to discover this function. So let's just define a new random variable that will be transformed by a linearized version of this function h. Okay, so I'm doing Taylor expansion around the mean of x. Okay, so this is, this is a linearization around the mean of x, and I will compute my variance using this approximated variable. Okay? Of course, the mean is h of uh, eta x, right? So, uh, what I will uh, what what I will have is basically I need to subtract the mean from y tilde, so one tilde minus six mean will be simply this part, right? So it will be h prime at eta x x minus eta x and this is exactly the second order moment that will me give the that will give me the variance of y tilde. So let's take this quantity outside the mean. It, it goes out with with the square. It's h prime, the derivative of my function at at eta x squared, times what remains in the parentheses is the variance of of x. Okay, and let's now substitute. Uh, my true quantities here, the mean and the variance are gamma e. Okay, so it's gamma e. e is missing here. So it's h prime at gamma e squared times gamma e. Okay, and I want this to be one for every gamma e. Okay, so let's rearrange things. So h prime at gamma e equals one over the square root of gamma e. So I divided by, I divided by this expression and took the square root. Okay, and of course it it should be valid for every e. So it just, let's just call gamma e. Let's call it let's call it uh, call it uh, uh, some by some other name. I will just integrate, and the integral will give me twice the square root, twice the square root of gamma e. So let's now substitute. Substituted in this form, I will I got the, the following variance stabilizing transformation, y equals twice the square root of x, and instead of x, I can plug in my expression in terms of d. Okay, so it's twice a over b d minus b. Okay, so if I apply this transformation to my variable, the uh, the variance will be approximately one. So of course I did this linear approximation; it's not exactly one. And if you do the math slightly, sli slightly in a more detailed way, you add this bias of three over eight, and uh, uh, you can basically find this uh, original paper by Anscombe, who defined this transformation. It's called the Anscombe transformation. It is the variance stabilizing transformation for Poisson distributed variables. And essentially, if you transform your image with Anscombe transformation, uh, the additive IAD noise model can be assumed. Okay, not before. So if we want to do image denoising and you want to assert additive IAD model, you better first do the Anscombe transformation. Okay? 
Now, the Anscom transformation, of course, will ruin uh, linearity of such things like convolution, for example. So many papers that, uh, that say we have an image convolved with the system H and then contaminated by additive noise. No, this is not a correct model. Okay, so it might be, might be approximately correct, but it's, it's not exact. And uh, things tend to work sufficiently well to some extent, and then if you want to get the additional performance, then you need to understand what happens and to, to model things correctly. Okay, and there are zillions of papers in making incorrect modeling assumptions. They get something that works in simulation because the simulation, of course, follows the same assumptions. But if you try to, uh, to deploy it for real, uh, for real images, it will not work. Okay? Okay, so th that, was, uh, that was the parenthesis I wanted to say about uh, noise in imaging. So let's move forward. I would like to... Uh, I would like to describe a scenario that I think many, many, many image, image processing tasks will fall into it. Suppose I have some latent signal F. It's a, uh, in, in our, uh, basically from our perspective with, uh, uh, that, that we have been developing here, it's a random quantity, it's, it's a random signal. It is latent in the sense that I cannot measure it directly. And I can measure it through a forward model that is written here. So it will be degraded by some, some system H. So, well, degraded sounds bad, but it will be measured by some system H. And usually the measurement is, is not perfect, so it is a degradation. It might be contaminated by some noise. And once we did the ANSCOP transformation, uh, we can assume that this is additive IAD noise, otherwise we cannot. And this is how we get our measurements. And this is the only observable part in the system. So I, I don't have direct observation of F. I have direct observation of Y. Okay? For example, the image that we got from our camera, we wanted to get E. And, and what we actually got was D. Right? This is our Y. This is our measurement. So it is contaminated by some noise. And it might be blurred by some lens blur. The, the blurring happens to E itself, right? It happens at the level of optics. Then the sensor adds all the, all the noise contributions. And of course, I'm interested in inverting the action of this forward model. So I'm interested in solving this inverse problem. I would like to estimate F from Y. Okay? So I argue that practically any task in image processing can be written in this form. At least can be stated in this form. Doesn't mean that it will be easy to solve, but we can state it this way. And what is the naive solution? What is the naive solution to this problem? You see H, let's just write H inverse and we're done. Right? So this is our estimated. So, well, first H might not be invertible. Could be the case, in most cases this is the case. And even if it is formally invertible, this inverse might amplify noise to such an extent that, that the estimate will be unusable. Okay, so let's just have a look. Uh, let's say we have this forward model with convolution. Okay, so the, the action of H is convolution. Let's say blur. I am blurring my latent signal and then I'm adding noise. So suppose this is my blur kernel. This is my blur kernel, right? So let's say it, has, it looks like out of focus blur for some optical system. So it is a low pass filter. Okay, it's inverse. Let's say there is no actually decay to zero. So the inverse will go very fast to infinity, right? Because the, the, the forward model uh, vanishes fast in frequency. So it will be a high pass filter. It will be amplifying uh, high frequencies. And suppose this is my signal. So it has some energy in this rectangle. And this is my noise. You see this very, very low white signal that is my noise, right? What happens here that you're going to multiply this tiny amount of noise by a huge number, by this. And it will be much higher in power than the signal that you have. So basically the signal will, will simply drone in, in the noise that you're going to amplify. This is, this is what will happen if you just invert the system. And there are many systems that behave like this. Many physical systems are essentially low-pass filters. So somewhere you cannot, you cannot uh, pass all the frequencies you need to cut high frequencies. 
at least optical systems are physically limited by the diffraction limit of uh, of light so they are low pass at some uh, at some frequencies so this is a bad idea to invert uh, to invert the system directly let's see what we can what uh, what we can do with our uh, with our uh, statistical framework. So I would like to, to define uh, the setting of statistical estimation. I would like an inverse model. This will be an estimator of, uh, of y. So y is a random quantity. f hat, the estimator of f, is also a random quantity. But I can write it. Let's write it as f hat is some deterministic function g of y. So it is a de deterministic transformation of a random quantity, which is our measurement. OK? Now I can define the error signal, which is the difference between the true signal f that I cannot measure directly and my estimate of this signal, which I obtain from y. And y can be measured directly. And of course I can, I always uh, want to, to do things optimally, just because it, because the pleasure, the feeling of pleasure of doing it. Uh, uh, so, I will define some optimality criterion epsilon that I will apply to this error signal, some discrepancy, some, some, some uh, measure of, the, of discrepancy that I will put here. And I will optimize over all possible estimators that minimize this quantity. So we can argue that any, any, uh, any estimation problem can be written in this form. Of course, you need to agree on the family of functions that you are searching over and the a specific optimality criterion that you are trying to minimize. Okay, and th this will be this will be our setting for optimal estimation. Okay, so specifically, I would like to go back to the deconvolution example. So suppose that the forward model is convolution, but by the way, it doesn't need to be convolution, and my inverse model will be will be a linear translation equivariant system. It will be convolution with some other kernel g. So I'm taking my measurement y and I'm convolving it with, with g. So, of course, in the noiseless case, I would just take the inverse of h as my, my g, right? Of course, because of the uh, existence of noise. By the way, even if I, I, I have a physical system that has no noise at all, which is impossible, of course, just the rounding noise, the quantization noise that I... I I introduced by storing numbers with some finest precision arithmetics is already a source of noise that will kill my attempt to just plug in uh, the formal inverse of, of h, right? So there, there is always noise. I cannot just do inverse. So uh, it is numerically inst unstable. Uh, so I, I will need to find this system g. How will I find it? I will find it by, by solving this optimization problem, OK? So again, I'm looking over all impulse responses such that when I convolve this impulse response with y, it will give me the best estimator in some sense of f. Okay? I see I ran out of time, so I'm, I will show you what we will see next week. Uh, we'll, we'll make a pragmatic choice. Uh, the pragmatic choice of selecting the mean squared error, MSE, as our error criterion. And this will lead us to a closed form solution for our optimal estimator that, is, that will be called the, the Wiener filter. Okay, so I'm sure many of you know the Wiener filter, so we will quickly derive it. it it's very, very easy. It has a very nice and, uh, and elegant form, and it is completely useless in image processing. Okay, because basically this pragmatic assumption uh, is not very useful for images. It will basically the, the use of the Euclidean distance of L2 norm squared will produce blurred results, and we'll see how to basically to abandon these uh, pragmatic choices that uh, lead to nice uh, closed form expressions in favor of models that are more correct, but we might not necessarily uh, know how to solve or not, not, will not be necessarily easily solvable. Definitely, there will be no closed form expression for the, for the inverse operator, but it will be still the solution of some optimization problem. OK, so we'll basically, this is what we are going to, uh, to build in the next uh, few weeks in this course.